Sega challenges you with Afterburner, a game so exciting you can imagine you're in for the fight of your life. Game accessories sold separately. Get ready! Hello everyone and welcome back to the 8-Bit War. In my previous video, we talked about console and controller design. Remember, if this is your first time here or you haven't done so yet, please click that subscribe button and the bell icon. It really helps me out, supports this channel, and lets you know when I'm going to make future posts. In this video, we're going to start taking a look inside of the consoles at the tech specs. So let's go ahead and get started. It's important to note that there are two different processor types that were used in the mid-1980s on gaming consoles. The Nintendo Entertainment System used a custom chip that was based around the 6502, which ran at about 1.79 MHz. The Sega Master System, however, used a Zilog Z80 based processor and that ran at about 4 MHz. The Atari 7800 again used a 6502 compatible CPU that ran at 1.79 MHz. However, this was able to be scaled back to 1.17 MHz to enable 2600 backwards compatibility. Now, you may automatically assume that the Sega Master System's processor was better. However, due to the differences in processor architecture, it may take more cycles to accomplish the same tasks that the 6502 could. And although a processor is essential to make a console function, it may not be the determining factor in which of these consoles perform better. When it came to gaming systems of the 1980s, most gamers were mainly concerned about which console could provide graphics that were closest to the arcades. This was an early focus of the Nintendo Entertainment System. Its custom graphics chip, titled the Picture Processing Unit, was capable of displaying a 256 by 240 playfield, along with being able to produce 64 sprites per screen, a maximum of 8 per horizontal scan line. The chip was capable of producing 48 colors in total, although there were several limitations on which colors can be used at once. Sega's graphics chip, dubbed the Video Display Processor, had a slightly smaller playfield, however it was capable of producing the same 64 sprites with 8 per line as the Nintendo. The difference here is this expanded color palette of 64 colors, being able to show 32 of them simultaneously on screen at once. The 7800 used a custom graphics chip called the Maria chip, although it also had the Tia chip in the console as well to provide backwards compatibility for 2600 titles. Overall, it has the smallest maximum resolution, however, it has the most amount of sprites, having 100 per screen and 30 per line. Technically speaking, the 7800 has the most colors, however, all the colors are generated from just 16 basic colors, and they are able to use different hues or different brightness settings to change the colors into different shades. Years later, these tech demos show off what the maximum capabilities were on these older consoles. Clever programmers have found a way to push these consoles to their theoretical limit. They combine some of the old programming tricks that coders used to use back in the day, and combine them with new and most often undocumented ways of pushing these consoles past what they were supposed to do. Though no games exist from the console's lifetime that would use these tricks, these feats are still very impressive. It can be hard to judge a console's graphics chip just solely based on the games that used it because it was actually up to each game developer to be able to program the chip to have its maximum potential be shown on screen. So when judging each game console's graphics chip, I'll try to actually include both the technical specs and the way it was used. So which game console has the best graphics? Before I give you my judgment, here's how you all voted on Twitter. Well, from my perspective, the clear winner here is the Sega Master System. With almost every game that I put into this system, I was impressed with the graphical prowess of this console. That expanded color palette of this system allows it to have just that much more detail on each character and background that just seems to be missing on the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Atari 7800. I was tempted to go with the 7800 for best graphics, but even though they were allowed to have more hardware sprites on screen, and possibly more colors, I noticed that the character models and backgrounds had less detail on this console consistently over every game I tried. The Nintendo Entertainment System has a lot of iconic and amazing artwork that came out of that system, but I feel a lot of that was despite the console's limitations, rather than because of the console's strengths. 
I gotta tell you, Sega's graphics instantly hooked me into each game that I played. You know, I've long said that better graphics doesn't necessarily make a better game, but in this case, it was something that made a good game better. It was just something that I kept noticing, like, wow, this looks like a Nintendo game, but it looks so much better. Having that expanded color palette so that they could add just that much more detail to everything just made everything, in my opinion, look a little bit better. And it was something that, you know, after years of playing the Nintendo Entertainment System, I've seen a lot of graphics on that system. Some of them are great, some of them are not so great, but overall, you can tell that they were limited by what the graphics chip could do on that console. I didn't get that sense as much from the Sega Master System. And to tell you the truth, I was actually rooting for the Atari 7800, especially due to that sprite count, but the lack of detail and everything and the blandness of it just really left me with some crushing disappointment. So that said, I do believe the Sega Master System does have the better graphics compared to these other two consoles. Alright, next let's move on to the sound chip. This generation of home video game consoles marks a change in how video games were designed with sound. Where the previous generation focused mainly on short melodies as a title theme and sound effects throughout gameplay, this generation was expected to have a musical accompaniment to play throughout the entire game. Taking a look at the Nintendo Entertainment System, you can see its multi-voice sound chip was evidence of this. The NES sound chip is capable of producing two square waves, one triangle, one noise, and one sample all at the same time. Usually, one square wave channel will be devoted to the melody, while another one would cut in and out based on sound effects that needed to play throughout the game. The noise channel was also quite heavily used for sound effects, and some even used the PCM sample channel. However, when no game sound effects needed to be played, all channels were sometimes devoted to just producing the song. Let's take a listen from a brief example from Super Mario Bros. 3. So this song actually uses all of the sound channels from the NES's sound chip, including that PCM channel. I will note that this channel wasn't commonly used, it was mainly reserved for sound effects and the occasional musical track. Here's one example of a game that used the PCM sample channel very prominently in its game soundtrack. Listen carefully and you can hear the orchestral hits and the bongo drums that are used in that channel. Of course, many game composers found ways to make beautiful sounding music without using this channel at all. Listen to Mega Man here. Mega Man's soundtrack is often regarded as some of the best music that was produced on the NES. That, and of course, Final Fantasy. Many of the themes written for this game have been reused in almost every core Final Fantasy game to date. The NES sound chip is actually very limited because other sound chips at the time could have actually produced different waveforms and had more options on what the waveforms could do. To combat this, the Famicom actually had a way built in for developers to include more sound channels via cartridge, and this was something that never made it over to the United States. For example, some Konami games used the VRC7, which actually used a modified YM2413 chip that added six to operator channels. Let's go ahead and take a listen to an example of this. In case you're wondering, if you tried to use the Famicom adapter on the NES, it actually will not make use of these channels as there's no way for those pins to be wired through the console. At least not without modifications. The Sega Master System sound chip was a little bit different in the fact that it could produce four voices at once, however three of those voices were devoted purely to square waves, and one was devoted to noise. If one wanted to create some sort of PCM sample, they would have to sacrifice all of the voices in order to create that sound. Because all channels were forced to make the same type of sound, some of the music does sound a bit more generic. That said, some game composers were able to make some very beautiful sounding music even despite this limitation. Let's listen to a clip from Sonic the Hedgehog. This song was actually ported from the Sega Genesis to the Sega Master System, and I think it was done very well. Since the master
master system sound chip only produces square waves, I think that a lot of music sounds very similar between each game. It's not that they have the same melody, but it's like they use the same instrument. And I think, especially after repeated playthroughs of the same music, everything sounds very bland and can get worn out very quickly. Nevertheless, I did find some catchy tunes that were created on this console. This is from Enduro Racer. The soundtrack from Shinobi also received critical acclaim when it was initially released. When researching several fan-made top 10 lists of Sega Master System games that had the best soundtracks, Sky High Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was frequently towards the top of everyone's list. Again only in Japan, Sega released a sound expansion unit that used a YM2413 sound chip. This would give the Sega Mark III almost the same sounds as the Sega Genesis, a generation early. Here's an example of the Space Harrier theme done on the FM Sound Synthesis module. And here's that same theme as it plays on the original Sega Master System game. I previously stated my disappointment in the Atari 7800 sound chip using the same exact chip that they used in the Atari 2600. This was initially included for backwards compatibility, but this eventually became the only way of producing sound on this console. So that means it can only produce two voices at once. And not only that, but it's a bit more limited on the types of sounds you can create. So its use during gameplay was mostly limited to sound effects only. However, some games were able to kind of work around this and create music during gameplay, but it didn't really work out too well. Here is an example of game music that was created years later in a tech demo, where someone attempted to port the song from the Bad Apple tech demo to the Atari 2600. <laughs> Okay, so that is actually tough to listen to. It actually kind of sounds like the instruments are out of tune, especially when compared to the Sega Master System tech demo. I think the main reason why it may sound that way is actually not because of how it was coded, but because of the limited number of sounds that the TIA chip was actually able to produce. So you're pretty much stuck with whatever the TIA chip will give you. Most of the time, if music was included on the Atari 2600, it was a short intro tune before the game started. And then the game would go back to just playing sound effects during gameplay. The best example I can think of of music from the Atari 7800 using only the Atari 2600 chip has to be the game Dark Chambers. During gameplay, I actually noticed that I was thinking of this theme throughout the entire time I was playing. Again, this follows the same style that was used on the 2600, where you have an intro tune and there's only sound effects during gameplay. The only saving grace for the 7800 was the fact that you could actually include Atari's 8-bit computer sound chip, the Pokey, inside of your cartridge and it would produce four square waves. And I know at least one of those voices could be swapped out for a noise channel. This allowed more advanced music to play throughout the game. The trade-off was it would make the game more expensive as they had to include another chip in the cartridge. There are only a couple of games that were released during the console's life cycle that utilized this chip. So again, I had to look through the homebrew scene to try to find a melody that actually utilized every channel of the sound chip, and here's a good one that I found. So wow, that is actually a night and day difference between what the Atari 7800 stock chip and the Pokey chip will give you in terms of audio quality. Of the two licensed games that use this chip, Ball Blazer is perhaps the most famous example. Commando also made use of this chip, and is one of the few games to have a soundtrack that plays throughout the game.
I much prefer the audio produced by the Atari Pokey Audio chip. Unfortunately, there were only two officially licensed games that came out that used this chip. So which one of these consoles consistently sounds the best? First, let's show how you all voted on Twitter. Well, the easier decision is actually to say which console is last, and that is the Atari 7800. But when deciding between the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Sega Master System, it actually took me a little while, but I eventually decided that the Nintendo Entertainment System has the better sound consistently. One reason why I chose this system is the fact that you can have different sounds, including PCM samples, while synthesizing music. I also feel that the variety of tones that the chip can produce creates music that is more interesting to listen to over a period of time than on the Sega Master System. I do feel like the Sega Master System's music does sound bland and generic after a while, especially when listening between games. And although this may be more of a fault of the programmers and the coders behind the games, I didn't notice this as much on the Nintendo Entertainment System. So even though the Nintendo Entertainment System sound chip is very primitive, I actually prefer the sounds it makes more than I do on any other console of its generation. I think the fact that it has dedicated channels that can make different sounds gives it an advantage to make the music not sound as bland when being played back continuously over and over again. I want to note that I'm actually not comparing specific songs or which one had more songs that I felt sounded better. I'm actually just comparing between consoles that I got tired of their music of when I was hearing the songs over and over again. I think that the Sega Master System's music can get very generic very quickly because it's making the same square sound. Yeah, they can change it a little bit, but they can't change it enough to make it have that richness or variety, if you will, to make it sound like that there are different tones being generated. And when you hear those sounds over and over and over again, it can get a bit annoying. To tell you the truth, if Atari had included the Poké audio chip in the 7800, Atari would have hands down won this one. Not only could it produce the same square waves of the Master System, but that chip actually gives more options to music coders to manipulate the waveform to make different sounds. So if that had been built into the system, I think the Atari 7800 would have won in this category. Alright, well that about wraps it up for this part. In the next video, we're going to start comparing some of the gameplay, which is, I think, probably the most important part of these consoles. Again, guys, make sure to leave a comment below letting me know what you guys thought about today's video and what you think about the graphics and sound of these consoles. That said, I'll see you all next week. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon.